Um, I kind of wanted to talk tonight a little bit about uh, when was and is perfection available? You know, <clears throat> there are some that think that it's been available ever since the early church. Uh, of course, the local people here know that I don't uh, see it that way, but but I wanted to give some scriptures. Sometimes I think it's good that if we talk about and go over some of these areas that uh, <clears throat> have certainly been held to through the past. Um, in Brother Souders' day, Brother Souders had reached a place that he felt like that he felt like the body had reached a place that uh, that perfection or making the bride was was possible. Um, and uh, it, you know, prior to you know that, it was taught that the, down through the dark ages that there wasn't enough truth restored, <clears throat> there just wasn't enough. Uh, and and so, and that was when, when I came in the body in the late 70s, um, that was the primary teaching that I heard that, you know, it, it, that we had reached a place where there was enough truth to overcome, overcome and make a bride. Uh, anyway, um, I think probably everybody in the body knows that I see it's going to take a restored church. One of the things, and I want to, I want to clarify maybe some of the thinkings, because I've, I've had men say, well, you're taking away hope from the saints of God, which to me, it's just the opposite. I feel like I'm given more hope. Um, uh, but one of the things I do want to make plain is, is that if a person isn't striving to do all that they, that God's requiring of, them. you know, every one of us are on a different level of, of the process of salvation, depending on, you know, when we came in and, and it, it, the longevity doesn't have everything to do with whether or not a person can, uh, you know, in other words, if somebody's been here for 20 years and somebody else has been here only five years, that doesn't, that 20 years doesn't automatically make that person that far ahead or even ahead of the person that's been here five years. I remember one time when Brother Clyde Patton was talking to us in a minister's meeting and he said, uh, when he first came into the body, he and his brother, Brother Don Patton, were, uh, they were butchers. And Brother Souders found that out. And so, Brother, and, and it, back in those days, they would, different men, um, a lot of the brethren in the body, owned farms and raised animals. And so they'd bring a, you know, a calf or a hog or whatever. And so Brother he, <laughs> brother Souders put Brother Patton down there butchering those animals to feed the people. And he said, I, he said that really, I, I really chafed over that because he said, I didn't, I felt like, you know, I'm, I spent everything I could get to get here for 10 days and they got me down here in a hog pen <laughs> slaughtering an animal and, and uh, cutting it up to feed the people. He said, Brother Souders, he said he never said anything to me about it, but I, I knew that he knew I was chafing under that. You know, here all these brothers are up on the hill in that meeting and I'm down here cutting meat. He said, one day he walked by me, he put his hand on my shoulders and he said, Brother Clyde, you know, his name was Clyde Patton. He said, Brother Clyde, if you'll, if you'll do this unto the Lord for the people of God, God will bless you. He'll bless you in a, in a wonderful way. If you, if you, you know, get the right, at, if you have the right attitude, 
God gave you a privilege of serving his people. And then he said, he just kind of tapped him on the shoulder and walked on by. Well, he said, I thought about what he said to me and I repented in my spirit and I tried to get my spirit right about it. He said, one day there was a, they found a guy that would help cut the meat and they brought me up on the hill. And he said, I got to go up there and sit in the tabernacle and hear the word of God. And he said, it just seemed to me like that God made my brain like a sponge. He said, I just soaked up everything that was going on in, that meet, in those meetings. And he said, I realized after a period of time that there was people who've been there for 40 years that I bypassed them. I, I said, I don't mean that in a bold, what, brazen way, but I just could see that they, didn't, they weren't getting what I got out of all of this. And so, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just using that to show that how that, you know, God, God deals with us according to our, how we respond to him dealing with us and, and God lifts us up according to our, our ability or our diligence, our servitude. Anyway, so, um, uh, I just wanted to, I want to use some, some thoughts here tonight about perfection and uh, that I think we should consider. Uh, and I'll start off in, um, in, in the book of Genesis and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and share my screen with y'all if that would be okay. I'll open this up. And these are notes that I've, I, you know, I've got to where I'm using my Bible on my iPad or on a tablet. I, I don't even, I can't remember when I even looked into my written Bible. It's been uh, quite some time. I've just got used to my software and, uh, you know, I can put my notes in it and it just makes it easier for me. So I'm, I'm, I didn't think I'd ever be able to do that, but I've gotten so used to it that I haven't even took my actual physical Bible to church with me in ser probably several months now. So anyway, uh, these are notes that's in my, this is my Olive Tree Bible app. And of course, there's not, you know, it's got notes all in it, but these are notes that I made concerning this with the scriptures. So in Genesis 3, 22 and 24, I, I can, oh, I think I could open this up because I don't know if y'all, can y'all see that note very well at all? Let me see. Can y'all see that? You can Okay, <clears throat> so it says, and the Lord said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now at least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was, it was take, he was taken. So he drove out the man in the place at the east end of east of the garden uh, of Eden. Uh, and he placed at the east end of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned in every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Um, see, it, where's the, there's a scripture there. Did I pass over it? Where he said, yes, right here. Where he says, and now least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree and eat and live forever. So <clears throat> I'm using the Garden of Eden here as the same as the holy place, our second heaven. It's a second, uh, second of course, the, the, the Garden of Eden to me was more of a, it was a condition more than a physical place, even though it was a physical place. Uh, but it, it, I've even said this many times. I said, I, 
I problem I I've come to have my doubts whether or not Adam slept in the, the same bed the day after he um was removed from the garden and the day before he moved. Because there was two cherubims, which they have to be symbolic, and a, the flame that turned every direction. There was no fence around the garden. So what would have kept him out of the physical place? But what he did lose and what he was put out of was the relationship that he had with God. Rather, rather in some way, God wouldn't let him back in that physical place or not, I, I can't say. And it's an assumption that, uh, you know, I don't think the physical place, although God was uh, emphatic about some physical things early in, in, uh, in uh, the way that he structured things. So it's, that's not an argumental point with me. It's just a thought. Um, but here, for man to get back in this condition that Adam was in, he would have to pass through that flaming sword between those two cherubims. Those two cherubims represent the two covenants that God made with man, God and Christ in both those covenants. That, and pa passing through the, the word of God that turned in every direction. It, it, God judges everything when it comes to um, uh, full righteousness or uh, uh, what's the word? A full age. That's the word I was thinking of it, that uh, Paul used in Hebrews 5. And so uh, for man to get back in there and eat and live forever, he had to pass through that. Uh, God put that up to keep man out of it, and 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 it, but it does leave the indication that man can get back in the garden. So I'm just using that to show that that the garden. Uh, I'll, I'll use a, a few more scriptures. I'll give you a couple more scriptures that'll go along with that that will uh, bear witness to what I'm saying about that. Uh, I'll mention, I do want to mention here when God, most of you, if you're, you're reading your Bible through this year, you've probably already read uh, in Exodus, you know, God, uh, Moses bringing God's children or Israel out of Egypt. And the Lord instilled the Passover there in Egypt. And God brought the children out of Egypt at Passover. Uh, and then when they came through the Red Sea, they had uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, which is, a, to me, it was a, a, you know, that was a type, God, and that was a harvest time. It's always harvest time. And I think that's, in, that's important to understand. It's always harvest time when, uh, when, when God, harvested the end of the gen of the Je Jewish world it was harvest time it's going to be hard it's going to be another harvest in the end of the G Gentile world and the restored church uh, I'll give you some scriptures on that but in Joshua and here's a type that we've always used here in Joshua 3 um, let me see if I can get to it here Joshua 3.13, it says, it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, uh, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand up on a heap. And it'll come to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priest beareth the ark of the covenant before the people and they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan and the feet of the priest that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water for Jordan overfloweth all his banks at the time of harvest and uh so uh, here I, I mean uh, I 
believe I, I'm, I know I don't have it wrote on here, but anyway, so if you've, if you've been reading, you know, in these early books of God bringing his children out of Egypt, we've always taught that they were, that the children of Israel were in the uh, wilderness when they came out of Egypt. We've always taught coming across the Red Sea as a type of coming out of the world, but uh, across the wilderness, we've always showed that as a type of the, the Gentile church uh, uh, that, that when the church fell away from the early church, the New Testament church, when it fell away uh, and God uh, started all over with another world, the Gentile world, and the church had fell away that we came through a wilderness of a fallen church uh, that God's dealt with us now for nearly 2,000 years from the day of Pentecost, and that the restored church would be crossing Jordan to enter the promised land. That would be a type of crossing over Jordan. I read to you when Joshua brought the children there across Jordan it, that was harvest time and that Jordan had overfilled its banks. We've always taught that Jordan, the overswelling of its banks at harvest time was when in, in the spring. I've, I've, I've told this before uh, several times uh, how that Israel had um, they had an early and a latter rain. We, we do quite a bit of talking about the early church being the early rain and, and us being the latter rain. But if, if you actually look at it, Israel had, had two rains every year. Their early rain was absolutely the opposite of the way we look at spring rains and fall rains. Their early rain was in the fall, which would be equivalent somewhere around our October time, or October month, when in the end of their harvest year, they plowed their fields. And that's when they had, of course, the uh, Feast of Trumpets, the, the, um, uh, the atonement was made that was repentance for all the sins for for that year, they plowed their fields and they sowed their barley and their wheat seed again. And then the early rains, which was the fall rains, fell. And though, and then those rains, I mean, th that seed was planted and it went through the whole winter. It never came to harvest. It wasn't until the latter rain. It, you know, and it won't be down here until the latter rain. Our, I think our, the early rains was Paul, the apostle Paul. He planted the seed among the Gentiles and God rained on that. We, it, that, that was rained on. It brought forth uh, seed, but it never came to uh, fruition or to a harvest. I was raised on the farm. And so you, uh, you know, we we it was it was normal for farmers to plant rye, wheat, or barley in the fall time, and it would grow. It would grow up in the fall some after the after the fall rains. Um, it the the cattle and animals could eat it on the warm months of the winter. It would grow some, but it never the earth never got close enough. Well, let me let me restate that. Doesn't have anything to how close the earth gets. You know, that's how I used to, you know, I didn't understand enough about astrology or the way that the, the solar system worked, but but the 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 earth in the springtime, the earth at it at its axis, its tilt, tilted to where the, the heat of the sun could bring forth a harvest. It could bring forth, it got, it was, it would get hot enough. The heat from the sun would affect the earth where it would bring forth the spring, after the spring rains, 
it would bring forth a, a fruition of a harvest of the barley and the wheat. And then all the rest of the year's harvest took place. So at, at Passover, that's when the barley would come ripe. 50 days later, pa Pentecost, which is what Pentecost means, 50, that would start the wheat harvest. That's when the barley always ripened earlier than wheat. And that started their, their harvest year. And then they would have their, uh, they would have their grapes and have their figs and have their nuts and have their olives. They had, uh, I think there was actually two ripening times for the grapes. Uh, all of their harvest for all their food all year from, from Passover until the until that year's end, which is when they would have the Feast of Trumpets, and that would be a rejoicing and a thankfulness for the harvest that God had gave for that year. Well, I'm just giving you that to show that, uh, uh, you know, we're looking for a harvest time, and uh, I want you to look right here in Revelations, the 14th chapter. In the 14th verse, you've heard us brethren mention this many, many times where it said, now this is in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations. And, uh, and this is during the time of the seventh trumpet. Seventh trumpet blows in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations. Um, and uh, I, I want to say something about that because a lot of people I don't think understand this. Uh, let me see if I can put it in an understandable way where it won't be too complicated. I don't mean that I mean, y'all are all smart people, so I don't think there's anything too complicated for you. But, but I'm going to say this about the book of Revelations. The book of Revelations opens up with, in the fourth chapter with, with the trumpet calling John up to show him things that must be hereafter of the future. That's the first chapter of Revelations 4.1. So, the future of the Gentile world starts in that fourth chapter. God was dealing with the seven churches in Asia in the second and third chapter, getting them ready for AD 70. Now, so uh, the, in, and then in the fifth chapter, God shows uh, John a restored church. He starts him out in the fourth chapter showing him a restored church of the Gentiles. But the fifth chapter, he shows him the seven seals that the book sealed up and it's never been revealed until now. It's time, it's time for that book to be revealed. And one of the reasons is, is because uh, it's the last scriptural writings of the New Testament. And if the church had fell away, we wouldn't have got it. We would have never got the book of Revelation. It was time. He said that and Revelation's first chapter, I think the third verse, that time is at hand. It was time for God to give this revelation to John so it would be put in scripture. Okay, so these seven, these seven seals are opened up. And here's what I feel you ought to understand. Every seal, they're in chronological order. And when a seal opens, it stays open until the next seal opens. And, uh, and the first six seals are synoptic, small bits of information. You don't get very much out of them. Because, I mean, the first seal is just a white horse and a rider on the horse. We know that rider was Christ with a bow in his hand going forth, conquering and to conquer. And the second seal was a red horse, a different rider with a sword in his hand. He was given power to hurt man. That's it. Uh, we have to use other scriptures to explain a little bit what we're seeing there in that synoptic knowledge of that seal. The first six seals are like that. They're synoptic seals. Uh, the seventh seal 
is it starts out on it starts out with seven trumpets on the day of Pentecost, and it goes through from the seventh seal. When that seventh seal opens, that seventh seal stays open through the entire rest of the book. It never closes. That's all one seal. And it gives it gives a tremendous amount of detail of what's in those six, those first six seals. The sixth seal is more, gives more knowledge than the first five. And the reason it does is because that sixth seal has to do with the end of the Gentile world and the last prophetical hour and the making. Uh, it actually finishes in the, in the half of the last sixth chapter to the seventh chapter, it finishes the plan of God the end of the seventh chapter. Uh, then in the eighth chapter is where the seventh seal opens up and that seal blows and it starts off with seven trumpets. And those seven trumpets are similar in this way that they're all trumpets of messages that started in the early church, started with Christ and it goes all the way down and they're in chronological order. But in the 11th chapter is where the seventh angel sounds the seventh trumpet and that's how important the last prophetical hour is it covers from the 11th chapter to the 22nd chapter half the book is the last prophetical hour it's it deals it starts dealing with it right there it does several times it'll go back and pick up from the day of pentecost and move forward to help uh, it'll move forward to help uh, lay up, you know, help you get a foundation of, because many times he has to go back and say, okay, here's details. I need to get, show you some details in another perspective, another light, or covering another aspect of what took place from the day of Pentecost. Like for an example, the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation starts off with a woman and standing on the moon, clothed in the sun, crown of 12, stars over her head. He's starting back there with the early church, but he, what he's leading into is the war that took place in heaven, which was Christ and his ministry against the dragon power or beast system of that day. And that ministry, that was Rome, that led up to the 13th chapter where the Pope of Rome in AD 325 received power from Constantine, and he's leading into that because that, that beast power lasted for 1260 years. So he goes back at different times, just like in the 11th chapter, he goes back to the Paul giving a read like a do a rod, and he, 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 uh, uh, he has to measure the temple because it's going to be done away with. That's why God has him to measure it, and the Gentiles are going to trot it underfoot for 1260 years. That's the same 1260 year period, but it's a different happening that was going on. So he, he starts back and covers these, these areas at several, several times. Okay, so I, I, the reason I brought that up is because in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, the seventh, the seventh angel sounds the seventh trumpet. We used to have, and let me let me just say this because. I don't know how many of the brethren, and I do know we do have brethren that still are holding to an older teaching of the seven trumpets blowing during the millennial. I, I don't think you can do that. I'm sorry, but um, see, if you're looking just like here, when the seventh trumpet blows, it never quits blowing. When you get over to the 14th chapter, you're in the harvest in the end of the Gentile world. You're nowhere in the millennial. The, 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 the mark of the beast is, hadn't even been set up yet at that time. And it was just, it's, you know, the mark of the beast set up in the 13th chapter. And so then the 14th chapter, there's a harvest. And, there, you know, the ministry at that time is got those three messages, fear God and give him glory, 
uh, Babylon's fallen and don't take the mark of the beast or his image. And then that chapter ends in the harvest of Christ setting up on this white cloud here in the 14th verse. Said, now look, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set it, like to the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Well, that's harvest time. If it's in the last prophetical hour, which I'm showing, then this harvest is going to take place in the last prophetical hour. I'm concerned, and I, you know, I'm 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 still asking brother to help me if I need help on it, but I I'm concerned that we're moving a little bit too far ahead, saying that we have all we need. I hear men saying that all the time. What do we need that we don't have? I'm going to give you an answer on that. Uh, um, here's some things we need that we don't have. Number one, we don't have a chief apostolic ministry that has anywhere near the power of the early church apostles, chief apostles. We don't have any men whose shadows pass before people raise the sick, cause the lame to walk again, raise the dead, that all see the same thing alike and that God stands with them in judgment. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed. God stood with that ministry. We don't have a ministry yet that has reached a place that God's gave that kind of power to. Um, we don't have we don't have the, we're not together, all together on the truth yet. And I'm not trying to fault the body on that. I'm just showing that we're not, we're, God still got some work on us to get us to a place where we uh, are speaking the same thing. We're, we can't all be right and be preaching the different things. So, and, and we understand what we're doing. We understand we're trying our best to give forth what we feel like that we're seeing in scriptures, and I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for the thrashing floor we've had all these years because it's kept us from settling on something that God wouldn't let us settle on because men kept bringing up other things, just like I'm bringing up tonight. I'm saying, help me. If, if you can help me uh, look at this maybe a little bit different way, I'm willing to look at it, but I want you to consider what I'm saying. Um, Okay, so that was a harvest. Uh, I'll go here in the 11th chapter. Let me just bring it up right quick. The second woe is past. Behold, third woe cometh, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, uh, and he'll reign forever and ever and ever. So here, when the seventh angel sounds Christ, I think you're going to see in this last prophetical hour you're going to see Christ on a white horse again with an army of white horses and those that sit on them that are with him who are called, chosen, and faithful. Now, let me give you this scripture in Joel 2. Wow, why is that not any better than that? Here, I've got it already down here. Look, see where my deal is. Joel 2, verse 2 and 3. Here's a day of darkness and gloominess and clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains and a great people and a strong that have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. I've said that indication right there. After many generations, we're the people, the restored church that will be like this strong people great and strong that there's never been any on the earth like. Now it says, a fire burneth before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them. Here's a people, going back to Genesis 3 now, 
Here's a people that are headed back into the Garden of Eden, a second heaven condition. Um, the land is as the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness, the fallen church, the church fell in its fallen condition after God finishes that harvest in the early church. This shows a prophecy of New Testament church headed back into the Garden of Eden. Okay, uh, then and Joel 2.16 says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children of those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of her chamber and the bride out of her closet. This is talking about the early church, of course, because you remember Peter on the day of Pentecost said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He was showing that little prophecy of the book of Joel was being fulfilled right there on the day of Pentecost when God started the her harvest in the end of the Jewish world. Uh, I've already mentioned this, that we taught the children uh, in, in the wilderness. Uh, was it harvest time? Uh, Ruth 2.12. This is what uh, Harry says, the, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Uh, the thing I want to mention here is, is that when Ruth went back with Naomi, it was harvest time. She was gleaning at the harvest time in Boaz's field. And he was telling her, he was, he was telling her that, that she could receive a full reward. Um, he did give her some strong admonition not to glean in any other field other than the field of Boaz. And so we know, let me get back to my, uh, so uh, I'm just showing, we all know Ruth's the type of the bride, but it's a, it was a book that was written uh, over 1,200 years ago for the Gentiles. J Ruth was a Gentile, Moabitish female. And in that picture of that little book is a picture of the church falling away. It was a great dearth in Israel. Uh, Elimelech moved to uh, Moab. And of course, he died. The picture of uh, the ministry dying during the Dark Ages. And his two sons. And uh, only one of them had enough influence. And that was uh, Ruth's husband which was, what was his name? Uh, let me see if I can get that in my mind. Uh, my coffee is not working. I drank a cup of coffee before, <laughs> before we started tonight, but um, it'll come to me in just a minute. Uh, Mike Long, uh, Orpah's husband. I'm trying to think of it in a minute. He wasn't as important maybe. Okay, look, in, here in uh, Jesus showed the harvest of that world of the early church in John 4. Uh, I've already got it right here. Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are four months and there cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they're white, all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice. So in the early church, of course, it was a time of harvest. Jesus was saying to his disciples, and they must have thought he was crazy because he was saying to them, don't say it's four months to the harvest. If it was four months to the harvest, the, the barley and wheat was greener than a gourd. He's telling them it's white already. They must have looked at one another and thought, what is he talking about? But he saw a spiritual harvest that was already ripening that God was fixing to bring forth. 
they did they didn't see what he was saying at that time, but I'm sure they saw it after his departure, you know. And so uh, he said, I, re I sent you to reap whereupon you bestowed no labor. See, those two harvests I showed you, the natural harvest of Israel, the law of Moses was the early rains for Israel. They got the latter rain on, the, on Passover, the harvest time, when Jesus was the Passover and when uh, Pentecost started on the day of Pentecost, that was the harvest of that early world back there. Um, what does it say here, Matthew 27? Well, he's, uh, that's going to go to Matthew 27, 52. Uh, you know, we just considered it that harvest time was a time for uh, for the uh, uh, for that that resurrection, most people know that I see a resurrection of the just and the unjust as two different resurrections. I see Matthew twenty seven fifty two as a resurrection of the just for the early church. The unjust, I don't see anybody just in the final resurrection. In Revelation 20, all those people to me are unjust people. They come out of the sea, they come out of death and hell. I don't see anyone just in that. But Matthew 27 52, those people were just. And in Revelations, um, is that 11? Yes. In the 11th chapter, where it's the time of the dead. Uh, we could we 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 can go there right quick. I'm trying. I know I'm talking fast. I am recording it, so if anybody wants a recording, they can listen to it again. Because I know somebody told me said you're putting out so much, I can't hang on to all of it. Well, I don't have that long to talk. Here in Revelations eleven. Okay, right here. Verse 18, and the nations were angry. This is where uh, Christ is. Uh, uh, the, here it is, the, where the second angel, seventh angel sounds. Uh, so it says, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them to destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple an ark of the testament. There was lightnings, voices, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. That here the temple, in the early part of the 11th chapter, the temple was closed. The church fell away. The temple wasn't open. There was no way to get, get back in into heaven itself, uh, I don't. There wasn't even a way to get back in the Garden of Eden, or uh, the you could call it the holy place or second heaven condition. But here, I'm seeing I'm seeing this as a resurrection in the restored church, and a re and it being a resurrection of the just in the Gentile world, and then the resurrection. And Brother Leninger taught that. Uh, and I'll say I probably did get that from, I know I got the scripture from him. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm still holding on to that. That, that to me, it fits. Um, then here, uh, another type we ought to consider is that the horses mentioned in Revelation 6, Two through eight, <clears throat> we 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 know the horses. Zechariah shows us the horses do represent the church. Uh, Jesus is on the white horse there in Revelations uh, six, but in Revelations nineteen here it shows. I saw in heaven opened a white, a, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, 
and in righteousness he doth judge and make war, signifying the restored church and harvest time and the end of the Gentile world. And Jesus is the rider of that white horse or head of the church again. And if we're not in a white horse state, is Jesus really truly become our head? Now, see, you don't hear men saying this too much anymore, but it was taught very much when I was in this body 40 years ago or more. It was taught that Jesus was not the head. He's not become the head yet. We're, we're, we're still having to learn how to make him our head. We're still trying to get in that white horse condition. I still believe we're in a red horse condition. However, I will say, and I don't have time to go into it right now, but I, I know that that white horse didn't turn red overnight. And this red horse is not going to turn white overnight. And I am looking for some white hairs to start showing up in this horse. And, and you know, and that's going to take time for it to t turn completely white. I do believe that we are in... I'll just say that I believe we're in the last, in the 30 year period, one of the angels loosed in the river Euphrates in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations. Uh, I, I believe that the, the, uh, the one that loosed for an hour is the last prophetical hour, but the one right before that was 30 a month. And I think we're in that 30 year period. I think we're living close to the end of the Gentile times. So I think God's going to do, we're down in the foot members of this. I think God's going to do some miraculous things that are going to take place pretty fast in these last days. He was not the rider of other horses, therefore he became the head of the church. Again, the restored church is at the harvest and in the end of the Gentile world. Now here, let's look at the type of the tabernacle as to how we've looked at the aspects and what they indicate. We've understood the restoring of the church, that the gate and the brazen altar represent the Protestant movement, that God was restoring the church in this period of time when he had these reformers that developed the Protestant movement, which the gate, of course, we've always taught Martin Luther was that gate that we get in this through faith. But the brazen altar was a work of John and Charles Wesley, men that saw it took and required sanctification more than just faith, that there had to be uh, works. <laughs> I'll just say it that way. Giant James said that, show me your, your, faith, your faith without works and I'll show you mine by my works. The labor represents the Pentecostal movement. William Souders taught that, that the labor represented the Pentecostal uh, era. And uh, I believe that Brother Souders was the very heart of what God brought out of the Pentecostal movement. And I basically believe we're through it. I think we're through the Pentecostal movement and into the garment change period of a white linen garment that God, that's what God's asked us to get ready for to enter into a second heaven condition. Let me, let me say this about second heaven. Just because it was available in the early church, it wasn't available to everyone at any time. You had to go through a process. You had to go through, you had to come in the gate, you had to go through the brazen altar conditions, you had to go through the labor, you, you had to go through a process to get into the holy place. Just because it was available didn't mean that anybody could go in at any time they wanted to, but you had to be righteous to get into the holy place. That was a serious place to get into. Uh, it looked like if you want to, if you'd go back to the garden, that man had to live in the garden above sin. Um, Adam was required to live above sin, and he did until he consciously made a decision.
to go against God. Jesus, Paul called him the second man, Adam, or the second Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. He was, he was, uh, he lived in a garden condition from the time that God, I think from the time God uh, put him in his ministry until he finished, he lived, he never sinned. He had power. He had authority to live above sin. Uh, and I think that's a picture of the garden. I think you're in a dangerous place if you're in the garden and you ain't got the power to live above sin. Adam was given dominion over everything, including sin. So was Jesus. He could have sinned. I believe he was tempted in every point, but he had the power and he fulfilled the will of his father and never gave over to the human nature. And so, uh, okay, then, then here real quick, uh, I'm doing pretty good. It's not eight o'clock yet. We started at seven o five, so I'm 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 doing better than I thought I would. <laughs> Revelations eighteen. Consider the statement there in this chapter: "Come out of her, my people." And I heard another voice from heaven saying, "Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues." This is to take place in the last prophetical hour of the Gentile world and the harvest of the restored church. Babylon will be judged. Revelation 18.10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city for in one hour, the last prophetical hour and last trumpet, is thy judgment come and the Lord will withdraw himself from her. The Revelations 18, 21 through 24. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea. Thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. By the way, that could not be a sevenfold candlestick. God, we're, we don't have the full light of a sevenfold candlestick now, much less Babylon, but our high priest, Christ, Jesus Christ ministers us from that sevenfold light out of the holy place, and he gives us light. He's given us light. We've got light of that candlestick in a measure, but we don't have the whole candlestick yet restored. God's working on us to get us there. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. He removes all of that from Babylon. They still have some light out there. They still have the voice, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the east, and by thy sorcerers all nations deceived. And her, in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and all that were slain upon the earth. After the judgment of Babylon, we see in chapter 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Well, I, you know, in the 19th chapter, you see Jesus and I won't, I won't go into reading all that, but you see him on a white horse and the army that's with him. There's going to be another war in heaven. Just like there wasn't a 12th chapter of the book of Revelations referring to the early church, the war of Christ and his ministry against the dragon system of that day and, and their ministry. And of course, the dragon was cast out of heaven. That's that heavenly condition and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which is us. But in the 19th chapter, let me just click on it right here. 
Let me back up just a little bit because I want to say something real quick about this. Okay, for true and righteous are his judgments and he hath judged the great whore. This is all continuing to refer to what's spoken of of God removing all of the elements, all of God's elements out of Babylon and judging her. And uh, the voice of the bride, let's see, where, well, where did it go? Uh, 19th chapter. Let me just bring it over here and be easier to see it. Okay. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and four beasts fell down. Okay. Uh, here's the part I wanted to mention is first, first verse, our first two verses. For he has judged her, this harlot system and hath avenged the blood of her saints at her hand. If you remember in the fourth, in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations and the souls under the altar, God would not avenge their blood. And I'll tell you why he wouldn't avenge it. It's because there wasn't a, a ministry powerful enough at that time. There wasn't a ministry powerful enough to judge that system. If God would have tried to judge that system at that time that was persecuting those people, and I know how we've taught that, that that was saints under the altar. I don't agree with that. I think for weak on that, and I'm still waiting for the brethren to help me on that. I say those people is in chronological order. This took place after the pale horse, after the Catholic church, and those people were martyrs of the Catholic Church down through the, the dark ages of martyrdom by the Catholic Church. And God couldn't judge and avenge their blood at that time because he couldn't judge Babylon. It would have came back. He didn't have a ministry strong enough to judge it. But finally, in the restored church, God finally is going to have a church strong enough with a mighty voice, a strong voice to say, Come out of her, my people, and the multitudes of them that won't come out will be lost and judged in that system. But there will be a, a great number that will come out of that system, just like they came out of Judaism in the early church. And God will judge that system just like he did in AD 70 back there, and he'll avenge the blood just like he told them. You'll have to wait a little season. That was that was you know, that was a, that was after uh, the Catholic Church system, after the, and that's the way I'm seeing that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm just putting out, most of y'all are, are, you know, my people, but, uh, you know, those of you that are listening to me, you would hear probably a minister somewhere up in a meeting giving their position. We're trained, you know, so I'm not trying to turn anybody against the teaching that they may have, but when I hear someone talking different on the way I see it, I try to consider it. And I'm trying to get my mind open to where, if any way I could be wrong, uh, you know, well, certainly there has to be ways that I'm wrong. I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a corner on this, but I'm just giving you how I'm seeing it, but I'm willing to change. If somebody can help me, I need help. If, if I need on, on this particular thing, Anyway, I'm just showing you here in the 19th chapter, right here is where the blood was avenged, not only on them, but also their brother that will be killed in like manner. There, there will be, we've always taught that down in the restored church, there will be men that will lose their lives over preaching the truth of the gospel. So anyway, I realize that's, uh, I've been talking some on, you know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the fruits of the Spirit, and I know this veers us off of that to some extent, but the book of Revelation is a book that God's dealt with me for years, and I feel like that I, I just feel compelled to put some things out that I feel like 
God's revealed to me. Uh, anyway, so I think uh, I'll close right here with, with these thoughts. I'll go back here and stop sharing. Um, I do want us to pray before we go home tonight or before we, <laughs> I don't guess we're going home. We're probably already home, but, but before we close tonight, but, um, you know, brother Bill Daniels here in our local assembly, still in the hospital. He does have COVID. He's got, he's got a serious, you know, he's got, uh, he's, he's got serious conditions in his body and therefore we're really uh, concerned about him. He's, he also has, does not have any vaccines. So that's that, uh, you know, I'm worried about him. I've tried to get a hold of him. I can't go see him right now being that he's got COVID, but I did talk to him earlier this week um, and he seemed like he was doing fairly well. Sister Sandra York is at the Arkansas Heart Hospital. They're doing a cath on her. She's went in there with heart uh, chest pains and they did admit her and they're doing cath tests on her or they were when I started this. Or, uh, so we're waiting to hear more about that. Please pray for her. Uh, brother, brother Gary Wright and his wife, Becky, have both got COVID. And uh, they certainly need our prayers. And, you know, so we want to hold them up in prayer. We need to be praying for the Houston meeting next week. Uh, as far as I know, it's still on, even though <laughs> uh, I'm sure Brother Wright is it's touch and go, you know, trying to figure out what to do. But right now, I, I was told last night that uh, the Brother uh Brother Brown said he's still uh, holding to having the meeting it, it, as, as far as yesterday was concerned. So let's please pray for them. Uh, Brother Lewis in Norfolk, Virginia, his grandson that has cancer, that's taking these uh, chemo treatments pretty hard. It's really making him sick. He needs our prayers. I've got a niece in San Antonio, Texas, my brother's daughter, that's got um, cancer and she's taking chemo right now. Um, can't remember, pancreatic cancer, pretty serious cancer. So her name is Bonnie, Bonnie uh, Garza. Please pray for her uh, and her condition. Brother Goss in Keswick, Canada, and uh, his family. Uh, Brother Goss really been battling it with his uh, health in the, this last year. And he just can't keep the infections from his bladder infections he keeps getting. And anyway, I know the family's really going through it. And I know that the church needs our prayers. So let's keep praying for the people in Keswick and, and, uh, Sister Cynthia's daughter and Brenda, his other daughter, the family there. Uh, some of y'all helped me with your request. I, I can't remember everything. I probably don't know everything. Brother and Sister Weaver here in Little Rock need her prayers. Sister Crow, uh, the Theory family, uh, they're needing our prayers right now. Uh, they're not, uh, they've been somewhat sick with colds, and I don't think they've had COVID, but they've also had some other issues they're trying to get through. Sister, uh, this little, Brother uh, Fisher's little baby, Mallory. Uh, we, we really want to pray for her. She's been going through tests, which her test with the uh, GI uh, doctor was a better report. Than, than we got out of the heart doctor. So that, that gave us some encouragement. He felt like she's doing pretty well normal for, for where she's at. Uh, he wasn't talking necessarily about her heart, but it's talking about her, her, her weight and everything else. Uh, he, he felt pretty good about her situation. 
uh, he wasn't speaking of her heart, I don't think. But so we need to keep her on our, our prayer list. What else? Uh, Donna and Ann's mother, Francis. Okay, Sister uh, Nona. Yes, yeah, Sister Donna Henderson. And uh, uh, Sister Ann, Sister and her mother. I haven't heard yeah. a report. Have you got a report on her mother, Sister Nona? Uh, yeah, I, I think what she was saying that um, she does have uh, um, COVID. No, cancer. Yes, that's right. And it's uh, in the uh, four state four stages. I think that's what uh -huh. it is. And so uh -huh. uh, they didn't do anything, you know. Right. They're not wanting any heroics yeah. on her. So. Yeah. I don't know. She's up in age, and so we just need to pray for Sister Donna and her Sister Ann and, and of course, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, let's see. I was trying. Well, to... Smith got a got a report on Sister Sandra. Yes. Um, what is it? Everything went well. They put in a stint, and she will probably get to go home tomorrow. She had a little bit of a blockage, so that's good okay. news. Okay. Good. Good. Well, that's good that they caught it early. Of course, Brother Jerry's had, I think, four bypasses. Uh, and I remember when he had his his first one, his second one, they said, you can't have any more. Well, that's how far medicine has come in the last four years or 30 years. He, he was just 40, I think, when he had his first four-way uh, bypass. And uh, but he's had four, and then he's had stint. He had a stint or two in between that. He's still kicking. <laughs> so thank God he insisted today when she had uh, chest pains that she go that he take her to the heart hospital. And so I'm glad that they they were able to find that. That's a good report. Thank you, Brother Fisher. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, anyone else? Um, I can't think of anybody else sick right now in our church, you know. Uh, so let's all uh, let's all turn our and I get I don't know if Brother Strike's still with us, but I did want to thank him for being on with us. And uh, you know, I, I there you are, Brother Strike. I uh, if you get on with us again, I'll give you some room to talk. I'm sorry about tonight. I just, I didn't realize I was going to talk that long. And, and, uh, but anyway, we do appreciate you. Uh, Thank coming you. I do on. have a prayer request. Sure. Uh, Brother Bernie Travis's uh, wife passed away yesterday in Michigan. Oh my. Okay. I hadn't heard that yet. Brother Bernie Travis in Michigan. Uh, he Agnes, was, uh, Agnes Travis. Yeah, Sister Agnes. We were in Brother Atwell's church for many years, and, and he's worked there in Michigan, so remember him. They're getting up in age, too. It just seemed like we're all getting there. Their, um, son, their son lost his wife to COVID, too. Um, Mike Travis, he lost his wife to, cut, to COVID. Yes. Thank you uh, I think us. probably a year ago or just over a year ago now. Yeah. When did your dad pass away, Brother Mark? Was it in October last year or November? Uh, when? Yes, this last October 14th. October, yeah. All right. Well, we want to pray for Brother Strike's work there, too. And uh, Brother, Brother Strike was a diligent servant of God and, and uh, certainly worked over the Northwest uh, up there for many years. I don't know how many years he was in Montezuma, but a long time, wasn't he? Oh, hello. Yeah, they, he started the Missoula Church in 1970, so 51 full years now. Yep. Yeah. All well, right. Brother well, Smithers that's all... Turn our microphones, let's unmute them and so we can pray together concerning these things and 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 also just to thank the Lord for his goodness to us, and the good word of God. And um anyway, oh let me stop the recording.